Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As an ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We continue with the intro. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. With long life I will satisfy him. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. For he will 
command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up. Tread on the lion and the adder. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. As it was in the beginning. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. With long life, I will satisfy him. Let us pray to the Lord For the peace from above and for our salvation Let us pray to the Lord For the peace of the whole world For the well-being of the church of God And for the unity of all Let us pray to the Lord For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for this first Sunday in Lent is from Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I, of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar 
on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns, by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from James chapter 1. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Please rise for the gospel. Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Continue with the hymn of the day.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Sermon text is the gospel lesson that was read, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. The first Sunday in Lent is always about the temptation of Jesus for 40 days in the wilderness. Since this is the second year of the three year lectionary, the gospel reading today is from Mark's account of the temptation. So what does Mark have to say about the temptation? Chapter 1, verse 13, he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. That's it. That's all that Mark has on the temptation. Matthew has 11 verses. Luke has 13. Mark has half a verse. But... The brevity of Mark's account gives us the chance to look at the flow of events surrounding the temptation of Jesus. In the three-year lectionary, during Matthew's year and Luke's year, we hear the account of Jesus' baptism on the first Sunday after the Epiphany. Then we hear the account of the temptation on the first Sunday in Lent, like today. In those readings... There are a lot of Sundays between the first Sunday after the Epiphany and the first Sunday in Lent. It's easy to forget what happened on the first Sunday after Epiphany. Unless we intentionally take the time to examine the context around the temptation account, we might not notice the relationship between the baptism of Jesus and his temptation. But that's not the case in Mark. The brief but to the point nature of Mark's gospel allows us to hear the account of the baptism and the temptation in one reading on the same Sunday. Again, 9 to 13. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. Mark almost gives you the impression that Jesus was still wet from his baptism when the Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. And the Greek word translated drove in the text has two parts. The main part means thrown, and the other part is out. So you might say that the Holy Spirit threw Jesus out into the wilderness. But we shouldn't think that the Holy Spirit threw him out into the wilderness, into this temptation against his will. Instead, we should understand that Jesus knew this was his mission, to defeat sin, death, and the power of the devil, he knew that this temptation was coming. He knew that this was part of his vocation as our Savior. And his will and the Holy Spirit's will were in complete agreement. The proximity of the baptism and temptation narratives in Mark also provide additional understanding of the purpose of Jesus' baptism. Today's text covers an additional purpose, we won't talk about the others, but an additional purpose of Jesus' baptism. In verses 10 and 11 again, when Jesus came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. This appearance of the triune God the Father's voice, the Son being baptized, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, wasn't just for the benefit of Jesus, John the Baptist, and the other people who witnessed his baptism. It was also an announcement to the demons of this world that now the Savior was on the battlefield. The idea is that this was an intentional confrontation with the devil. We shouldn't think that the devil noticed Jesus fasting in the wilderness and thought to himself, now he's hungry, he's going to be weak, 
He'll be easier to tempt. This would be the time for me to tempt him. No, instead we should think of Jesus being eager to do battle with the devil for us. And the Holy Spirit was encouraging him into that battle. You might have been surprised to see a mighty fortress as the sermon hymn on the first Sunday in Lent. Uh, normally, that's a Reformation hymn for us. <clears throat> but there is a connection. The last half of the first stanza is, The old satanic foe has sworn to work us woe. With craft and dreadful might, he arms himself to fight. On earth, he has no equal. Then the second stanza refers to Christ doing battle with Satan for us. No strength of ours can match his might. We would be lost, rejected. But now a champion comes to fight whom God himself elected. You ask who this may be? The Lord of hosts is he, <clears throat> excuse me, Christ Jesus, mighty Lord, God's only son adored. He holds the field victorious. So, especially in God, Mark's account of the baptism and temptation close together, we can see that it's a war, it's part of the spiritual war, and the main part, really, of the spiritual warfare that's going on all the time, which we don't always see. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit leading Christ into the temptation is, wasn't that it was just an chance encounter between two enemies. This was deliberate. It was intentional. The, te the temptation was part of the intentional plan of God. But why is this temptation important? The writer to the Hebrews said, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Why is it, why is it important that Jesus was tempted, and why is it important that he didn't sin? Jesus earned our salvation as our substitute. He took our place as the target of God's wrath on the cross. He took our place on the cross just as he took our place on the cross. He must also take our place under the law. In Galatians 4, Paul wrote, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, us, so that we might receive adoption as sons. In order to be our substitute, he had to experience the things we experience. He had the power to come to earth as a fully formed and mature man, but he didn't. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He experienced the same period of gestation or the time in the womb as every other human experiences. He experienced infancy, childhood, adolescence, and so forth. He didn't just walk a mile in our shoes. He walked an entire lifetime in our shoes. And he did this to be our substitute. That's what his state of humiliation was all about. He could have dealt with every problem of life with his divine power and authority, but if he did that, he wouldn't have been being our substitute. Instead, in his state of humiliation, he dealt with all of life's difficulties with the same resources available to every other human on the planet. He did use his divine power to help others. But he couldn't be our substitute if he used his divine power <clears throat> every time he had a problem. If Jesus is our substitute, 
he must experience the same types of temptations we experience. At the same time, he has to do this without sinning. When we examine the Old Testament for the laws concerning sacrifices, especially the animal sacrifices, there's one phrase that appears in these instructions for every animal sacrifice. That phrase is, without blemish. Whether it's an ox, a goat, a ram, whatever, it has to be an animal without blemish, with no imperfection. All these sacrifices point forward to Jesus, who also must be without blemish. If he sinned even just once, his sacrifice on the cross wouldn't mean anything. We would still be in our sins. That's why it's comforting to hear Peter's words, you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. We also take comfort in the words of the centurion, the Roman centurion, who witnessed Christ's crucifixion and praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. If Christ has even one sin, then he can't carry your sin. But the Father made him who knew no sin, Christ, to be sin on our behalf or as our substitute so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Luke's account of the temptation of Jesus tells, that, tells us that when the devil had ended every temptation, that when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Now that doesn't mean that we should understand the devil stopped tempting Jesus at the end of the 40 days. He stopped tempting Jesus until the next opportunity. The devil used every opportunity he could to tempt Jesus. So for the rest of his life, Jesus had to fight off the temptations of the devil. It's good for us to know that Jesus lived a human life just like the rest of us. That life included the same kinds of temptations that enter our lives. It's good for us to know that even though Jesus endured temptation, he didn't sin. He never sinned. This means that when they raised him up on the cross, he was there as our substitute. He carried our sin. He suffered our punishment. He earned our forgiveness. I've mentioned this before, but it applies here too. The transfer of our sins to Jesus and his righteousness to us is a courtroom event in the language. We stand before God the Father who is the judge. We are accused by Satan of all of our sins and some things that aren't sins. The Satan, Satan tries to accuse us. But as the judge is about to pronounce the guilty verdict on us, Jesus steps between him and us and says to the judge, apply their verdict and punishment to me and apply my innocence to them. And the judge did just that. So Jesus was tempted in all the ways you are, but he did not sin. The ultimate sign that he never sinned was his resurrection. His resurrection assures you that he did all the things perfectly. It assures you that the judgment, that the judge pronounced him, Jesus, guilty and you innocent. It assures you that Jesus' death in your place was a success. It assures you that you also will rise from the dead. And finally, it assures you that you will live with him forever 
in heaven. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise. Let us confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we enter this Lenten season of repentance, and renewed devotion, we pray that you would remember us according to your steadfast love and goodness in Christ and instruct and lead us by your Spirit in your ways so that we may repent and believe the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, you placed the wood of the cross on the back of your only, son, only begotten Son that as the promised descendant of Abraham, he might overcome the gates of hell. Bless his church and all those called to preach and teach within her with the certainty that those gates, including COVID-19, cannot prevail against them, that in faith in Christ, they may boldly trample underfoot every power of the enemy. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, preserve all catechumens and their teachers, all children and their parents, and every Christian home from the assaults of the evil one. As your son overcame Satan in the desert by the word of God, so also give us the victory through Christ and his word. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father of lights, from whom every good and perfect gift comes down to us, Keep us from being enticed by our own desires to misuse your gifts in sin, and help us to use them rightly in service to you and our neighbor. Bless all our leaders that we may be governed wisely and justly for the good of this present generation and all those to come. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Most high God, our refuge in every trouble, you have promised to hear when we call to you. We pray that you would command your angels to guard our brothers and sisters, especially
and all those who suffer in our midst. Keep them from every evil that can befall the body, mind, and soul. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the, sal- we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive Renew and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace. The Lord Jesus goes with you. Amen.
please rise. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. We continue with the closing hymn.